It's two o'clock, so welcome back everyone. If you uh, stepped away for a brief break, we are continuing. And it is my privilege to introduce our next presenter, and that is um, Andrea George, or Annie George. And uh, she's going to be talking about COVID-19 and pandemic preparedness, and wow, okay, it's something that we did not exper expect to experience this year, right? So uh, it's something that we have been talking about a little bit before, Prior to, I think, before 20, uh, 2020 hit and began, uh, just in some of our uh, preparedness outreach efforts, but it's something that probably a lot of us didn't realize that we needed to um, really take seriously and start planning and preparing for. Uh, Annie is an infectious disease epidemiologist with the Salt Lake County Health Department. Uh, among her other duties, she is the lead surveillance epidemiologist for COVID-19, a big responsibility there. I'm sure she has a, a full plate of, of duty. She shared a very brief bio with us. So uh, Annie, feel free to share a little bit more about yourself if you'd like to, and then we'll turn the time over to you. Go ahead and uh, unmute your mic and and uh, we can see your slides. Perfect. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Annie George. I've worked for the Salt Lake County Health Department for um, going on six years now. So um, it's been been quite a ride. I have a, had a lot of people ask me recently, if you would have known that a pandemic would have occurred during your career, would, have you, would you still have done this? And uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I guess the caveat would be if I would have known it would have happened in an election year, maybe not, but um, that's presented its own unique set of challenges. But um, I, I still really enjoy what I do. So and it's a pleasure to be with you today. So I am going to go ahead and launch some slides here. So if you're listening to this presentation, you've survived the first eight, eight months of this pandemic. So congratulations, you must be doing something right. As we've gone along though, I hope you've taken the time to make notes of some things that you didn't have on hand and you wish you would have had, or maybe you would like to have on hand if this were to happen again in the future, because the reality is um, another pandemic will likely occur within your lifetime. Our world is very mobile anymore and it's a real possibility. So for all our sakes, I hope the next one isn't in an election year or that we don't have simultaneous earthquakes or windstorms happen at the same time, but things happen, right? All right, so first I wanna start out with a bit of a disclaimer so um, and a plea for patience. While I wish I was all knowing about COVID-19, I am definitely not. I will do my best to answer any questions that you might have. And the plea for patience comes on behalf of not only myself, but all of us on the front lines of this pandemic in one capacity or another. So at the beginning of this, you all heard this referred to as a novel coronavirus. And novel, the word novel means new. So we don't have all of the answers about this virus at this time. It, um, we're learning and it takes time to understand and guidance that we give might change. So we ask you to please be understanding and flexible as that happens. All right, so I want to start out with a poll question. So how many of you feel that you were prepared for this pandemic? Um, either 100% of the way, uh, you got your garage full of toilet paper now and Clorox wipes on hand, um, either somewhat prepared or not at all. And then I'm not seeing it. Let's see. There we go. I, I've just launched that poll for you. There you go. It should be available Perfect. to everyone. Awesome. We have eighty percent in just under 30 seconds. Good job, everybody. We'll let it go for just another half a minute. Okay, it looks like that may be all the people that are going to uh, vote in this poll. Go ahead and close that and share the results there. All right, so it looks like most of you are in the, in the same category that I would have put myself in, so somewhat prepared, um, which is excellent. 
better than being not prepared at all, but <laughs> we're, we're all learning at this. Okay, so I've divided um, the presentation up into different segments of a pandemic response, and I'm going to be using different scenarios to give you some guidelines of how to prepare and how to respond. So first, what to do before it gets here or before we know that there's one on the horizon. So step one, let's do all, all do our best not to start a pandemic. So generally speaking, viruses shift when they are passed to a different species. In the case of COVID, they think it started in a bat and then went to an intermediate host before making the jump to humans. So let's all try to do our part of washing our hands after we've touched animals, uh, consulting a veterinarian or animal control officer if you see an animal that's showing signs of illness. Um, please, please do not kiss them. I would say dogs are the exception to that. Um, and then please do not lick them. Um, so let's all do our part to, to prevent the start of a pandemic to begin with. And I know you're thinking this doesn't really happen. Um, go, if, if you need proof of this, go hang out at a um, county fair sometime and watch, watch the kids interact with the animals. It, it definitely does happen. Okay, um, now I wanna go over a few pandemic essentials. So uh, the good news is if you're prepared for other types of, of disasters, you've already gone a long way to prepare for a pandemic. So here are just a few ideas. Uh, make sure that you've got food on hand for, for a pandemic specifically enough to last for at least two weeks. That's the, the incubation period of this virus, we believe. So that's why the quarantine period lasts 14 days. So if you can have enough on hand to at least last at least that long that's that's helpful um second cleaning supplies and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in specifics um i would also recommend having quite a bit of soap on hand hand soap other types of soap um hand sanitizer and then lotion um, i know that's a strange strange suggestion but um if you're like me you've washed your hands an awful lot lately and um your skin is now resembling something similar to an elephant skin and not what it would normally look like so I would advise keeping some lotion on hand. Um, and then toilet paper, that one was kind of the funny one that we we didn't really expect, uh, I don't know, so much. Everybody was making fun of, of people that were hoarding it to begin with because we're like, it's a, a respiratory disease, but it is possible for respiratory viruses to cause GI upset. And it just so happens that this one does. Um, so if you wanna keep some of that on hand, I'm sure we've all probably got an adequate supply now. Um, that's that's a good idea. Another thing I would recommend is electrolyte replacing drinks. So something like Gatorade or uh, something similar to that. That's important in case you do develop GI upset or um, or if you're dehydrated from a fever or something like that. So that I would recommend. And then um, I always recommend having chocolate on hand for any crisis situation that makes it a little bit better. Um, this this picture is is a picture of, of my trunk after I made a trip to Costco one day and I thought it was funny that that bottle in the middle I promise is really hand sanitizer. Okay, next um, I want to talk about some medications to have on hand. And before I do, I don't have any financial interest in any of these companies. I'm just using them as examples because they're they're common household names. So uh, first, I would recommend having fever reducing medications on hand. So Tylenol or something like that. Uh, next medication that you could use for headaches or muscle aches, so Tylenol, Ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, something along those lines, any of those should work. Next, some sort of cough medicine. Um, if you don't use these products super frequently, it's important to watch for expiration dates on them. If they're expired, uh, please dispose of them and dispose of them properly. Uh, next, I would recommend a supply of any prescriptions that you, that you are currently taking. So in a, in a former life, I worked as a pharmacy technician. That's how I paid my way through college. Um, so I know that some ins insurance companies will fill some of your medications early or give emergency supplies. Um, another recommendation is don't wait until you're completely out to refill your medications. If you fill it early a couple, you know, a couple days at each month, then you'll eventually, you know, accumulate a stockpile. Some other supplies I'd recommend having on hand. Uh, please have a thermometer. The, um, it's kind of been interesting as we've gone through the process of contact tracing and and uh, and whatnot. There's a lot of people that do not have a thermometer at their household, so please please invest in one. Um, another good idea is a pulse oximeter, so you can uh, check your oxygen saturations. They used to be really expensive, but uh, they're not too bad anymore, and they're gradually starting to um, become available again after 
everybody panic bought those two. I got one recently on Amazon and it's not too expensive or um, I think the, the latest and greatest Apple Watch also has one on there if you would rather go that route. But something I would recommend about both the thermometer and the pulse oximeter, treat these like you would your batteries, so, or sorry, your, your uh, flashlight. So make sure that you're um, checking fairly often that your batteries are still good, maybe having some uh, spare ones on hand for those as well. Um, I can speak from experience, the, the battery in my thermometer died and I had to call up mom and dad on that one during the midst of all this. So uh, make sure that you have batteries on hand for these products. Another thing I would recommend is disposable gloves and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So one another thing you can do before the, before the pandemic arrives is make sure that you're you're taking care of yourself, keep yourself healthy. Make sure that you're exercising um, to build up your lung capacity. The better shape that you are in, should you contract the virus, there's that can go a long way to predicting the outcome that you have after, after contracting the virus. Um, next, make sure that you're eating healthy. Try not to be a little poo bear here and eat all of your quarantine snacky snacks in the first couple of nights. Um, make sure that you're making wide, wise food choices. And lastly, make sure that you're getting enough rest that will help your immune system um, be strong. So a few other suggestions in terms of preparedness, I would suggest using the, the eight dimensions of wellness as your guide. So we've talked about some of these already, but um, a couple others, make sure, you know, in terms of mental, emotional, spiritual health, this is, it's huge in a situation like this. I think we can all relate to that. Um, sometimes we need to be supported and sometimes we need to be the one to support someone else. Um, Another one mentioned on here, financial support, uh, or uh, yeah, financial preparedness. Um, make sure that you're putting some money aside for a rainy day. And I know that's a lot, maybe a lot to ask of people right now because um, you know you may have been laid off or something like that. If you can't start that right now, uh, start as soon as you can and start, if you have to start small, that's okay, but compile, you know, compile some funds for a rainy day. Next, I am a huge advocate of flu shots. So um, please, please get one. Uh, each of the flu shots typically have four strains of the flu in them. So even if you hear that it's not effective against the most uh, dominant strain that's circulating that year, get it anyway, because there's three other ones. Um, this year, it's especially important because if we get enough people to get their flu shots and, and flu, the spread of, the, of influenza remains low, that will help decrease the burden on our overly um, taxed healthcare system. Um, it is circulating already, not widely, but we have seen a few positive cases here at the Salt Lake County Health Department. Um, we do an enhanced flu surveillance here, and we, we do have data to show that even if you do get the flu, we've seen that patients generally have less severe outcomes from, from influenza. If you haven't gotten your flu shot already, please do. Um, if you live here in Salt Lake County, uh, we are giving them out for free. Um, so go ahead and check the, the Salt Lake County website that I've listed here. And there's, there's more information and, and details there about the times and locations that you can go, um, regardless of whether or not you have insurance. Okay, so the next phase, um, the pandemic is here. So now what do we do? Um, first and foremost, whatever you do, do not panic. It, it doesn't do any good. Um, so just, you know, try to remain calm as, as things progress. Um, so along those same lines, please do not hoard things. <laughs> so um, please purchase supplies and food in, in normal quantities so that there's enough for everyone. Um, I took this picture at Costco during, I think it was at the end of February, and I was like, what in the... I, because we'd been so involved in, you know, and working with with what to do if it did come here, that we kind of missed that everything was flying off the shelves. So we had to have some black market, um, not black market, but we had to do some toilet paper trading in the parking lot on more than one occasion because we hadn't been able to make it to the store ourselves. So please, please be responsible at what, about what you're purchasing and purchase only what you need. Um, next, I hope that. Um, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, I hope that it is this. Please be sure that you're getting your information from reliable sources. So we live in a day and age where we have almost limitless information available at our fingertips. This is a blessing and a curse. Um, at the beginning of all this, when it started to circulate in China, thanks to Apple News, I was 
probably reading the South China Morning Post more frequently than a lot of people in China were, just to, to get the information and, and details that were, that were coming out of China. Um, but over time, this flood of information has uh, actually created a problem. Um, it's caused what they are now calling an infodemic or a flood of information that is in, has come in varying degrees of truthfulness. So um, in, incorrect information, we're, uh, for this purpose, we're dividing into two categories. So there's um, what they call misinformation which is false information that is spread regardless of the intent to mislead. So in this um, in this situation, think uh, a neighbor down the street, maybe it's Betty that spends all of her day on Facebook and thinks that because it's on Facebook, that means it's gospel. So um, they continue to share anything that they see on Facebook. Or um, this comment came out towards the beginning of the pandemic and all of my coworkers and I thought it was pretty funny. So it says that that's odd. My Facebook friends who were constitutional scholars just a month ago are now infectious disease experts. And we, we all found that to be true in our in each of our lives. So um, just, just be careful about you know, what's posted on social media. The second type of, of information is, um, of incorrect information is disinformation. So this is deliberate misinformation. So it's designed to deceive or mislead this is biased information, a manipulative narrative or facts. So someone's got an agenda behind whatever it is that they're trying to share. Um, I can't tell you how many calls or texts that I've gotten since this started uh, from family, friends, uh, people like that, that have, have asked me questions. You know, they, they say, I, I heard something on, you know, and is this true? And I'll be like, where, what? no, where did you hear that from? And oftentimes it is from social media. So. I, you know, kept telling them, you know, look, if it sounds fishy, if it looks fishy, it's probably fishy. So don't, you know, don't believe it. Um, something that I would encourage each of you to do, uh, you can, you can help fight the, this infodemic. So you can help by continue, not continuing to share or spread this stuff. If you don't understand a clip or um, an article, don't, don't share it on social media. Um, the, the guidance that I have continued to give. Uh, friends and, and people that have asked me is, think back to when you were writing research page, papers for your English class. If this, the source that this is coming from would not have been an acceptable one for you to use on a research paper, then don't share it. Okay, so like rumors and misinformation, let's also talk about how we can prevent the spread of germs. So first and foremost, my favorite one, please keep calm and wash your hands. Um, to go into some hand hygiene specifics. Uh, so we'll encourage the use of either soap and water or hand sanitizer, but there's there's differences in, in times of when these are recommended. So soap and water is always preferred. Um, it's also recommended any times your hands are visibly soiled. So if you, you know, like in the healthcare industry, we say if you've got anybody's bodily fluids or anything like that of any kind, then you need to use soap and water. Um, that can be, you know, a variety of, of different of different you know circumstances that come about. So if your hands are visibly soiled, please use soap and water to clean them. And make sure that you're washing for the correct amount of time. So if you sing happy birthday all the way through, that's that's about the correct amount of time that you should be washing your hands. Um, second, hand sanitizer. So it's a suitable replacement if soap and water is not available, but please make sure it's at least 60% alcohol. Um, you need to cover all the surfaces of your hands and continue to rub them until they are clean and dry. Next, um, covering your coughs and sneezes. So um, make sure that you're doing this appropriately. Um, oops, sorry, just a second. Um, make sure that you're doing this appropriately. So uh, if you are coughing or sneezing, please sure to be sure to do it into your elbow. Or if you cough into uh, a tissue, make sure that you throw it away and then um, go wash your hands. All right, next, uh, cleaning. So this is something we should be doing this time of year, whether or not there's a raging pandemic, just to prevent the spread of flu and other viruses that happened, happened this time of year when everybody's indoors more and in closed spaces. So um, cleaning is very important. Make sure that you are cleaning the high touch surfaces in your house regularly. So these are light switches, doorknobs, um, door handles of like the fridge and things like that. Make sure that you're disinfecting those regularly. 
the key part of this, and I actually didn't know this until I started uh, working at the health department, there are um, what they call contact times on contact times on each of the different cleaners. So make sure that you're paying attention to, and they're, and they're different for each type. So make sure that you're reading the instructions on your on your cleaning products. Um, you know, I used to think that if it's something said that it killed 99.9% .9 of germs, if I swiped, you know, over a surface once, that killed the 99.9%, .9 and two swipes went a long way to killing the remaining 0.1%. But it doesn't it doesn't quite work like that. So um, you need to make sure that um, that you're paying attention to these contact times. So a lot of it it has to the surface has to remain wet for a certain amount of time in order for it to to kill the germs. So please, 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 please pay attention to that. Um, next, um, use EPA registered cleaning products. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions during this about these obscure, when, when cleaning products were not widely available for a while and they're still largely aren't. I got a lot of questions about some really obscure cleaning products that were all of a sudden available um, or machines that would, that would do certain things. Um, I think if you if you look at this list, so there's um, this list from the EPA. There's you can search for the the EPA registered cleaning products that are um, that will for sure kill COVID-19. Really, it's not a very hardy virus, which is good. So I think if if you look at this list, there's a lot of very common cleaning products on there. So um, there's no need to go out and buy, you know, spend a bunch of money on some really obscure cleaning something that um, that is not necessary if if some of these other products will do so um, that's a re resource that I recommend looking at next this this is huge um, if you are sick please 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 stay home that is one of the biggest uh, biggest recommendations that we can give people to help stop um, the, the spread of this and, and any other illnesses please please stay home don't you know I think a lot of times we're like oh Look at that hero they came into work and they they don't feel good but they came in and they did that presentation and they nailed it um but we need to we need to i i hope if that's one of the things that comes out of this pandemic is is that the the culture around that changes it's okay to take a sick day um when everybody takes it the first day that there's snow in the mountains yes that gets a little suspicious so please please use your sick days appropriately so that um so that this this culture change of of being okay with sick days continues Next, um, please make sure that you're you're practicing social distancing. So, this is the <clears throat> campaign that the health the Salt Lake County Health Department is trying to um, promote right now. Um, so, hashtag practice or sorry, always practice your hashtag safe six. So, we all have T-shirts that say that to encourage everyone to to social distance. Um, it's best as as we learn to social distance. If you you know if you can't wear a mask, but if you you know, or visiting with someone, you can still wear a mask and social distance, that's even better. So please, please be cognizant of that, particularly, you know, at the grocery store or other places, um, wherever you are, please, please uh, social distance. So next, face masks. Um, this has become a very large pet peeve of mine. People will put them on sometimes, but they do not wear them correctly. So please, for the love, make sure that you are wearing your face masks correctly. So if you can um, see this cute little dog over here, it's got it on in all sorts of ways. Um, Please make sure that it covers your mouth and your nose at all times. Uh, somebody somebody shared this with us a while back, and we all thought it was we all thought it was pretty funny. But um, about every time I go to the grocery store, I can get blackout on the uh, ineffective face mask bingo. So again, please make sure that you're wearing it correctly all of the time. Okay, another um, another good practice. Please. Uh, Remember to avoid touching your face. So your eyes, nose, mouth, all of those are just gateways for the, the germs to get in. So before you touch any of those surfaces, please make sure that you have washed your hands first. Uh, next, please please do your part to help flatten the curve. So um, Dr. Fauci made this, this phrase popular at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, everybody bought into it in April. And uh, since then, enthusiasm has has dwindled to say the, the least but um this is now you know now more than ever it's it's important again because we've as you've seen our, our case counts have just continued to spike um and i know that this is a particularly subject with the holidays coming up but you know i'm thinking about it i think the greatest gift that you can give your loved ones this year is you staying healthy yourself 
and you doing your part to keep them healthy as well. So um, on the flip side, there's been some good things that have come from this pandemic. If this is the year that you're supposed to be with the side of the family that you don't like, you can stay home and also be crowned a pandemic hero all at the same time. So there are perks to the pandemic. Next, um, this one's very important. Uh, please, please look after your mental health. I know this is this has been a big struggle as as this has continued. We haven't been able to socialize like we've normally do or um, interact with other people like we normally do, and that's that's taken its toll. Um, so uh, this is something that you can work on before beforehand as well. Find strategies that work for you when you're when you're feeling low or whatnot. Um, and and stick with them. I know the presentation after this one talks about managing stress and that that I'm sure everyone can learn a lot from that during this particularly stressful time. Okay, on to the dreaded topic, what to do if someone you or sorry, what to do if you yourself get the whatever pandemic hypothetical pandemic we're talking about or um someone that you live with get end up contracting the disease. Um, first guidance I would give you, um, particularly if we're speaking of COVID, if you are symptomatic, please go get tested. Um, we've had a lot of resistance to that as of late, which it doesn't it doesn't help anything, right? We um, if people know that they have it, uh, then they can take appropriate actions. When um, you may have heard that the CDC sent out some individuals um, a couple of weeks ago to to meet with Governor Herbert and the Coronavirus Task Force. Part of that meeting came. Um, the conclusions of, of that meeting was that we needed to start doing what they call flood testing or testing a, a lot of people in a short amount of time of certain groups of individuals that were seeing high spread and so for right now it's like college age uh, kids so um there's going to be more testing to come those days that we get those results back will again probably be record breaking but if if people don't know that they have the disease we we can't stop the spread so um again if you are symptomatic please make sure that you go get tested um, there's information on the, the Salt Lake County's website or, you know, look at if you're not from Salt Lake County, look at your local health department or, or state website to to find where you can go to get tested. Um, so that is very important. OK, so some other guidelines you've been diagnosed now what or someone in your household. Um, the things that we just discussed still apply. So make sure that you're still following hand hygiene. So washing your hands, wearing a mask, covering coughs and sneezes. Uh, this is some additional guide, guidelines. Um, Make sure that you're staying at home unless you need to seek medical care. Um, isolate from other people as much as possible. I know that's difficult in a household, but you know, try to do it the best you can. If you have to wear a mask around them, fine. Um, just just do what you can on that one. I know that one's a, a big ask. Uh, next, inform the people that you have been in contact with for 48 hours prior uh, to your onset of symptoms. So um, that will help with with contact tracing. Those people can. You know, start monitoring for symptoms themselves or start staying home, whichever they're able to do. Um, next, monitor your symptoms. So um, you need to, to seek medical care if you have chest pain or if you're starting to have trouble breathing. That's where the, the pulse oximeter will come into, um, come into play. Um, so make sure that you're, you're monitoring your symptoms in case they get worse. Next, um, avoid sharing personal household items during this time. Um, that can be kind of tricky, but um, some suggestions that we've seen are, um, you know, using for the person that has the disease, use um, use paper products. Don't, you know, use regular dishes or or stuff like that. And that way, it can just be disposed of, and you don't have to worry about people that are washing the dishes. Um, make sure that you're cleaning diligently. Again, you know, again, those high touch surfaces. If you can't, if you don't have more than one bathroom in your house, you can isolate that one individual can can use. And um, make sure that you're cleaning the bathroom regularly because that's a a, a prime place for it to spread um, and that's where the the gloves that I recommended to have on hand will come into play too. Um, use the gloves while you're cleaning or maybe handling um, uh, laundry of from them or, or something so uh, please please be careful about that. And uh, next please please cooperate with public health so um, this is this has been a challenge, particularly as it has gone on. You know, when it first happened, everybody was more than willing to to talk to us, and it that's not so much the case anymore. Um, so we're not calling you with malicious intent. Please please answer your phone when we call or call us back, um, and answer the questions completely and honestly. Uh, this is one of those help us to help you 
Um, so we're gonna take a little hiatus from the PowerPoint presentation real quick. I'm gonna switch over. So um, while I'm doing that, can we do a um, raise your hand poll here? Um, if you live in Salt Lake County, will you raise your hand? Wait, I can't see the numbers. What, what's the split looking like? About fourteen percent. Okay. All right. So, if you don't live in, so sorry. They, being that I'm from Salt Lake County, um, and 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 work for Salt Lake County, I'm going to show you some Salt Lake County numbers here on give you a, a quick tour of our dashboard. But I know if you live in other counties around Utah, um, some of them have very similar ones. So, if you live in Utah County, yours looks very similar because we help them create theirs based on ours. Um, but other, you know, state health departments have have data, and I, I would encourage people to to look at this. You know, you don't have to look at it every day and you know memorize all the numbers, but um, I, I think it is helpful to know to know where things stand in the county, so or wherever it is that you live. So, this is our our Salt Lake County dashboard. Um, like I said, I because I'm the the chief surveillance and data analyst over um, over COVID-19 for Salt Lake County. Um, this is this has been one of our projects and it's it's evolved over time, but um, we've had a lot of compliments on it. So there's a lot of information on here. Um, you can divide it down by city if you like. Um, so look at specifically how things are going where you live. Um, every day you can you can highlight over the the case count. So um, yesterday's was uh, well actually was, so the data cuts off at midnight the night before. So for um, Wednesday, it was the highest case count, not only in the state, but also in Salt Lake County that we have seen to date, but 1,389 cases. You can hover over these bars and, and see where those, um, which cities have the most cases of that day too as well. So um, part of this is, uh, let's see, because it's gone on so long now, we kind of had to mess with the the visualization of, of what dates you can see. So you can zoom out and look at everything. Um, this is our total case count. These are the cases that were diagnosed with, that had a positive test within the last two weeks. So we call those our current cases. The total number of hospitalizations that we've had of Salt Lake County residents, uh, the number currently hospitalized, and then the number of deaths. So I wanted to address this one. I know there was some um, mis and disinformation around the number of deaths and COVID-19. Um, I can assure you that in the state of Utah, every person that passes away that has tested positive for COVID-19, you know, within a um, certain amount of time beforehand, um, those cases are all reviewed by the medical examiner. So while COVID-19 might not be the top um, reason cause of death on the death certificate, that doesn't mean that it didn't contribute to this, um, you know, the exacerbation of whatever problem is listed as number one. So. Um, like I said, in Utah, I can I can tell you that um, the deaths are all certified by the medical examiner. This number is actually higher, but um, we have to wait until they say that they are definitely a COVID death, and that's when it gets posted to the dashboard. Um, so we also have a summary of data by city on here as well. So you can look at uh, the percent of um, the cases in the county that are in each of the cities. Um, I'm going to go over this kind of fast since there's not a ton of Salt Lake County residents on here, but um, you can also drill it down by zip code. So um, for some of the larger cities that involve multiple zip codes, that's that's helpful to kind of target in on which part of the zip code or sorry, which part of the city you're seeing the most cases in. So like Salt Lake City, for example. Um, this is our testing our testing slide. So the number of tests that were completed and the number that were positive. So that gives our the number of positives over the total number tested is what gives us a percent positive. So you've heard that a lot in the, the news from some of the new mandates from um, the governor's office. Again, you can sort that down by zip code. This is probably my favorite slide of the dashboard because it's it's really interactive. So you can look at, um, the so this is the different age groups or you can divide it by sex or race and ethnicity. 
and then you can subdivide by these categories. So um, I mentioned a, a few minutes ago that we're seeing a lot of, of cases in the 20 or the like college age kids. So you can see that in the last two weeks that they've had the highest case count. So a lot of the slides will have a current, you can switch between current data and cumulative data. So um, cumulative is since the beginning and um, you can switch back and forth between that, but you can see that that largely has stayed the same over time. Um, you can look at hospitalizations. So we um, see a lot of hospitalizations in the, you know, in our older, older demographics. Um, then um, there's also, you know, information on deaths. Um, those over a year, we've seen the highest case counts in. Um, you can also look at ICU and ventilators. Oh, sorry, I forget that after that slide. It, kind of uh, jumps back to the first slide. So um, this is the rate of hospitalization. So all along, well, that previous slide, the, the case counts are, there's higher case counts in other age groups. This is this is a rate, so it makes it comparable above, or, you know, between all, um, all of the age groups. And our 80 plus has seen the highest, um, highest rate of hospitalizations. This is another one that estimates recovery. Um, this is not my favorite slide, but it was one of those everybody else had one, so we had to have one too. Um, it estimates the number of people that have, have recovered from the virus, but I've, the issue I have with this is it's based on two weeks, and um, a lot of times we, it's not uncommon for us to have people that are hospitalized for more than two weeks or symptoms that linger longer than that. So it's just, I like to point out, it's just an estimate. Um, this is this is Salt Lake County school data slide. So, um, you can separate it by by school district and look at the different schools within there. If you are from Salt Lake County, um, we've had a lot of questions about my kid's school isn't listed. Uh, so this isn't a complete picture. If, if it's not listed, which I don't know, it's probably very, very few that aren't anymore. Um, if it's not listed, that means there aren't any identified cases there. And the, the case counts are in, um, include cases that are identified since school began. So that's a little bit different for each of those, but that's how we, um, how we're keeping track. So we don't show exact case counts to for privacy reasons. So that's why um, the, the school guidelines are based on less than 15 or more than 15 kids. That's typically, if there's more than 15, and that's when they recommend that they switch to virtual learning. So um, that's the scoop on that slide. And um, this one's kind of fun. It looks it looks really busy, but um, it, there's a lot of information on it. So these these are the different types of outbreaks, the ones that are usually um, some of our bigger categories. So um, I think everybody's probably seen in the news that there's there's a lot of there's an outbreak going on at the Utah State Prison. So you can separate it down and look at just at outbreaks at correctional facilities or daycares or schools as a whole. So you can see once kids went back to school, the case count went with it. So um, long-term care facilities have had had problems all along sadly because it's a vulnerable population um next so this this one's this one's kind of fun too it breaks down the work sites portion of the outbreaks a little bit further so you can look at specific types so um the we've seen the greatest number of outbreaks in manufacturing type settings this is all based off of industry code Um, and then lastly, this is our this is a map that um, goes by case counts on the left, and then oh sorry, and then um, crude rate on the right. So you can hover over different areas, and it'll it'll show you the case counts within the last um, the last little bit here. Um, the darker the color on the map, generally the worse it is. So um, the the case counts for the, the because the prison is in Draper, that's um, part of the reason contributing to why Draper's is is so high. But some of these other areas, um, consistently the west side of of Salt Lake and also the south side, have seen a lot of cases as of as of late. So it's a situation that we're watching definitely and are trying to get um, testing rolled out to some of these areas. And then um, just to kind of wrap up here. Um, so, 
public health's primary goal in this is to, to help stop the spread and to get to get the situation under control. We do it for other diseases all the time and never with the intent of, you know, of, of taking people's freedoms or or anything like that. Um, you've again, if you watch the news, you've seen that public health has become a target as of late. But um, I can tell you for a fact that we 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 show up every day because we care. That's why we chose this profession. We because we care. We keep showing up, even though the numbers just higher. Um, and it's it's hard, but we we show up because we care. But that doesn't do a whole lot of good unless everyone cares. So you know, just as as a, a wrapping up message here, um, uh, this this quote by Dr. Fauci, I think. Um, really, really captures the essence of what, what we all need to accept at this time. So now is the time, if ever there was one, for us to care selflessly about one another. So there is still a chance to get this virus under control, but we have to work together. Um, public health cannot do that alone. So um, please, you know, as, as we continue and the, the, with the case counts this high, please be smart about the decisions that you're making because um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't just affect you or the people that you're around. It's, it's got farther reaching effects than I think a lot of people realize. Um, and then just last slide here, these are some resources. These are um, <laughs> resources that I trust. So the Salt Lake County Health Department has got um, information on there about, about testing flu shots. Like I said, um, our data is all is all there. There's flyers that you can use at your businesses. Some of them are pretty funny. You've seen some of those throughout this, this presentation. Um, the Utah Department of Health, that's where all the guidelines from the governor's office come from and state specific guidelines. So that's helpful. And last, um, CDC is is a gold mine for information. That website is is very well put together. They've got um, a bunch of uh, of information there that you can use for um, their. They'll walk through what steps you should take um, when someone in your house or you yourself test positive. It's there's a lot of information there. So um, I would recommend that you you stop in and check that out as well. So uh, that is all I have, and I'm happy to take questions. Annie, thank you very much. We really appreciate your uh, participation and sharing all that fantastic uh, pandemic preparedness information with us today. And yes, we do have a few minutes for some questions. I'm just going to jump right into them. Um, uh, Adrian comments that uh, maybe some cleansers or cleaning supplies, they mentioned they have coronavirus on the label that they treat coronavirus, but that may not be the same as COVID-19, that it might be just common coronavirus that causes the common cold. Is that correct? And is there a way to check that on your cleaning supplies? Yes, so I would I would recommend using that list or that link that I that I shared in the presentation. You're, you're exactly right. So coronavirus, this COVID-19 is not the only coronavirus that's roaming the, the planet, right? So um, definitely, I would I would check on that EPA registered list of products that are registered and and do kill COVID-19. That that link that I shared is is specific to COVID-19 disinfectants. Thank you. And and Bonnie asks, how do we know if you are calling compared to uh, scam callers? You mentioned the health departments may be calling for contact tracing or notifications on test results. How do they know that that's a legitimate call versus spam? Sure, that's that's an excellent question. So um, your contact tracer should have information that a uh, spammer would not. So you can ask them, you know, can you verify where I was tested at or what date was I tested at? Something like that is what I would recommend. We, um, you know, we, we've got access to information that a spammer would not and you're more than welcome to inquire to, to see. And does the caller ID always show up as Salt Lake County then? So they're they're working on that. Um, it doesn't because we had to hire a bunch of, of extra contact tracers to help us out, and they all have. Um, we didn't have room for all of them in the office, so some of them do have burner cell phones, but they will leave you a message or send you a text. Um, so it doesn't. The caller ID doesn't always show that, unfortunately. Okay. Do do uh, hand sanitizers containing 60% plus alcohol kill both bacteria and viruses? Do you know about the uh, hand sanitizer? 60% alcohol. So that's the safest one to use. I mean, I I do use hand sanitizer religiously, but you know, your best bet is to wash your hands. So it it should at that level, yes. On the slides that you shared about Salt Lake County, are similar slides available about some of the other counties around the state, like Utah County? Yes. So Utah County has their own dashboard, and it it looks like ours because, um, like I mentioned, uh, we helped them create theirs off of based on ours. So Utah County definitely does. I know we helped. Um, 
or River Health Department create theirs as well. So I, I think almost all of them do, maybe some of the smaller ones don't, but um, you're welcome to check in on the, the Utah Department of Health website. They have stuff broken down by county on there as well. It's just, we chose to have our own so that we can dive into the data a little bit deeper. Uh, and they, uh, Jill is asking if you could share the EPA link again. Uh, sure. Um, and while you're pulling that up, Dean is asking, do you see the United States eventually having an annual face mask wearing season in the winter time like they have in maybe other countries around the world? You know, we've, we've, I, I haven't heard anything officially, but we've talked, talked about that amongst ourselves is, um, you know, amongst our coworkers that maybe that's, that's a thing. Um, I don't know. It, I don't think it would be the worst idea in the world. Um, just how things have gone. So, <laughs> oh, you're not sure. Okay. This. Are you are you posting that in the chat? Yeah. To everyone. Okay. Annie is posting the EPA link in the chat. And another question from Ralph: Can you use isopropyl alcohol? when you can't find hand sanitizer? You, yeah, I guess you you could. Um, I'll use that to clean stuff around my house. The hydrogen peroxide is another excellent cleaner. Um, that one will actually clear, uh, kill some of the multi-drug resistant organisms. I do uh, surveillance on that as well. And they, they use hydrogen peroxide for some of those. So. Okay. Um, I think that was that looks like that's all the questions about all it's about all the time that we have as well but uh julia says annie thank you for your whole career of preparation and all you're doing to help utah at this time rachel says that was a great presentation thank you for your for all that you're doing and so yes we also express our appreciation to you and your work and thank you for being here today and presenting this great information to us um sure and I'll ask you really quickly, can can you, are those sh slides available on your website or uh, can you share those with us that we can maybe post on ours or? Yeah, or... yeah Kathy, I sent Kathy a copy. You're more than welcome to, sh to share those. So yeah, and the, okay. the dashboard, the data slides are all that updates every day and that's available on the Salt Lake County website, but these you're welcome to, to post on the okay. website. And we have our, we are entering break right now, about 12 minutes until the top of the hour for our next session. But Annie, well, maybe if you can just hang on, if people are still here, should high-risk people wear K95, KN95 or similar masks when others aren't wearing masks? Um, we'll go, let, let you answer that question as we go, are going into break. If you need to take a break, now is the time, and then please be back at the top of the hour. But go ahead, Annie. So if if you can find them, I, do, I mean, they're definitely a, a higher, you know, like they're, they're not medical grade masks, but they're one of the higher ones that, that you can you can get. Um, if, if you've got access to them, I say I say wear it, um, whether you're high risk or not. Uh, but um, try, you know, there's with the statewide mask mandate, hopefully there's not going to be a whole lot of, of people not wearing masks. I hope I hope I hope. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a good a good resource if you've got them, by all means, wear it. And the part of that question was, even if someone else is not wearing the mask, it is still going to pr provide a level of protection for you, yes. the wearer, uh, if you're around other people that are not wearing masks. But it would also be in increase that level of protection if you were still maintaining six feet distance, correct? Right, right. So all those factors playing together. So I mean, the best protection comes if people are socially distanced and both wearing a mask. But in it, you know, the the degree of protect, protection kind of goes down from there if you take away any of those elements. So, um, but yeah, if you can, if you still have your mask on and your social distance from other people, your your odds of getting it go down considerably. Okay. All right, um, Kathy Holder. I'm not sure if we have another com uh, uh, a sponsor uh, commercial at this point in time. Let me see if I can uh, pull one up. I don't know if we have one scheduled, okay. but I can pull one up. Okay, that's fine. That's actually, there's another question. Does wearing multiple masks increase level of protection? If you like layered them, I suppose. <laughs> okay, I'm guilty of that. Yes, I have done that. But um, uh, it, 
you want to be careful. So you still need to be able to breathe through them. Um, but yes, in addition of layers, if it's a very thin one, I would recommend wearing more than one, but you just have to be careful that you can still breathe through it. So, um, but you don't need to wear like six. That's, that's a little bit aggressive. Um, you know, two layers is generally what they recommend if it's a, if it's a cloth face cover covering. So. All right. Uh, and uh, it looks like those are all the questions, I believe. Thank you for that. Thank you again for your time today, your Thanks. effort in preparing and presenting this. And um, sure. I don't know if Kathy has a commercial ready to pull up. Can UVC light clean masks? Does UVC light clean COVID-19? Um, oh, oh, I'm sure it, I'm sure it does because it kills a lot of other a lot of other things. Um, I would I would just recommend washing your masks um, and make make sure that you're doing that. So we we had somebody that got sick because their mask like had mold on the inside of it and they continued to use it over time. So um, make sure that you're washing them regularly. And if it's if it's a disposable one, you know get get a new one. Um, don't don't use them continually. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you, Annie. Appreciate your time. We will. Uh, let you sign off in preparation for our next session at the top of the hour, which is uh, just nine minutes away. It looks like Kathy has pulled up um, some of our Be Ready Utah brochures that are available on our Be Ready Utah website. This one happens to be about disaster supply kits broken down into the 12 areas of preparedness, uh, the different items that you might want to consider putting into your disaster supply kit. Um, and then on the back side of that page, yes, you can build uh, other smaller kits that you may want to take to work, uh, send to uh, students in their classrooms at school, as well as uh, vehicle emergency kits. And those would all be separate kits. Uh, your your main your main personal disaster supply kit would be a lot fuller, a lot bigger, a lot more complete than those other work, school, and vehicle uh, supply kits. Um, but yeah, if you'll scroll back to the top of that page of that document again, uh, again it's broken down into the 12 areas of uh, shelter and fire, water, food, sanitation, and hygiene, which very, very much applies to our last presentation about pandemic preparedness. Light and power, first aid. Um, communication, safety and security, clothing tools and personal items, cooking, important documents and money, and transportation. And, so, and we will be talking and covering some of those topics in some of our other uh, presentations later today and tomorrow. Um, and again, we are in a break right now for about five more minutes. So hey, Wade. Yes. As, we, as we're in here, um, one thing we might want to do is ask about where people are from. They can put that answer in the in the question room that we have, um, just so we can see what our what our audience is, so we can uh, hopefully be helpful to them as we move along. Right. Absolutely. I think that's a great uh, a great thing to do. So if you want to take a, a minute during this break and just type into the question uh, the question. Um, tool under your control panel, just what either city or, or county that you are from. It'd be really nice to know where our, our participants are from today. Thank you very much. <laughs> 